1780, the Over Mountain, a ragtag group of frontiers, fiercely dedicated to the revolution against the crown, took a stand on this very ground, King's Mountain, South Carolina, and defeated the mighty British Empire. The battle destroyed the left wing of Laura Cornwallis's army, effectively ending loyalist support in the Carolinas, halted the British advance, forced Laura Cornwallis to retreat, and gave Patriot Nathaniel Green the opportunity to reorganize the American army. This decisive victory in the Southern Campaign of the American Revolution boosted the morale of the Patriots and turned the tide of the war. After five grueling years of fighting against the British, Washington and his troops are losing the battle for American independence. They are outgunned, outmanned, and outnumbered. Washington is working with a third of the troops and resources promised by Congress. The dream of independence seemed to be slipping away. The Southern campaigns in the Revolutionary War did not receive as much attention as those in the North, but many of the battles were decisive. Perhaps they were underrated because the heroes were not officers of the Continental Army, but the natural leaders of the people. When France joined forces with the Patriot Militia, the English shifted their focus away from the North and towards the Southern colonies. New efforts were demanded on part of the British government to subdue their rebellious subjects, and the Carolinas were targeted. Kings Mountain was definitely one of the more important battles. Without Kings Mountain, you never would have had a cow pens, and then of course without cow pens, you wouldn't have had a Guilford Courthouse. So we kind of stand as that stepping stone to the rest to October of 1781 when Cornwallis surrenders the British Army in the South. The surrender of Charleston, the defeat of the American forces at Camden on the 16th of August, and of Sumter two days later, all added prestige to the royal cause resulting in the complete subjugation of Georgia and South Carolina. The British believed the South is won. General Cornwallis had advanced as far as Charlottetown in North Carolina and was preparing to move his headquarters to Salisbury. In District 96, which was viewed as the most populous and powerful in the province, Cornwallis appointed Major Patrick Ferguson Inspector of Militia on May 22, 1780. Ferguson was a brilliant professional soldier with a long record of service. No man in rank and years ever attained more military distinction in his day than Ferguson. He was regarded as the best rifle shot in the British Army, if not the best marksman living. In an interesting turn of events, Ferguson was once on patrol duty and engaged a member of the rebel troops, who paused, but then cantered away. It was none other than General George Washington, and Ferguson determined. It was not pleasant to fight her at the back of an unoffending individual. Major Ferguson was tasked to march the old Tryon County area, raise and organize loyalist units from the Tory population of the Carolina backcountry and protect the left flank of Lord Cornwallis's main body at Charlotte, North Carolina. He managed in his efforts in the backcountry to raise almost 4,000 loyalist militia for the cause. Uh, he trained and equipped a thousand of them in the summer of 1780 and then he had about 800 of them here at the Battle of Kings Mountain. In the same part of the country lived a group of people called the Over Mountain Men, which refers to the fact that their settlements were west of or over the Appalachians, being the primary geographical boundary dividing the 13 American colonies from the western frontier. Without official permission and reward, these heroes of the frontier came together as brothers and neighbors and formed their volunteer army to protect their families and their country. There was no army standing between Cornwallis and his plans to march north and attack George Washington from the south with an army of Americans. Aware of this group, Major Ferguson sent a message to Isaac Shelby, one of the leaders of the Over Mountain Men. If you do not desist your opposition to the British arms, I shall march this army over the mountains, hang your leaders, and lay waste your country with fire and sword. Upon receiving Ferguson's threat to march into his community, terrorize his neighbors, and destroy their homes, Isaac Shelby wasted no time. The militia leaders decided it would be best if they crossed the mountains on their own terms and defeated Ferguson on the east side of the mountains. Thus did Patrick Ferguson, the would-be hunter, become the hunted. The Over Mountain Men joined forces with Patriot militiamen of North and South Carolina and Georgia. The leaders of the Over Mountain Men called for a mustering of militia units on September 25th at Sycamore Shoals near the Watauga. 
The militiamen prepared to cross the mountains, committed in their pursuit of a man who had threatened to invade their homeland, Major Patrick Ferguson. At the shoals, Reverend Samuel Doak delivered a passionate sermon. Brave men, you are not unacquainted with battle. Your hands have already been taught to war and your fingers to fight. Will you tear now until the enemy carries fire and sword to your very doors? No, it shall not be. Go forth then to the aid of your brethren, the defense of your liberty, and the protection of your homes. On September 26th, the throng of a thousand militiamen headed south from Sycamore Shoals. Most of the men were on horseback, but some walked. All the men were volunteers. None were paid. Each expected to serve for only a few weeks before returning to his home. This was not an army in the strictest sense of the word. For this last reason alone, the British military, the best army in the world, generally dismissed any threat from a fighting force composed of American volunteer militia. As Ferguson swept through the back country of South Carolina, he had great success in recruiting American colonists to join his army as loyalists. Ferguson was encamped atop Little Kings Mountain, believing that the high ground afforded him a military advantage should the Patriot militia catch up to him. He was later reported as having declared, he was on King's Mountain, that he was king of that mountain, and God Almighty could not drive him from it. His confidence in this strategy was soon to be tested. The Patriots advanced on all sides of King's Mountain, giving the enemy Indian play, yelling loudly and firing from the cover of trees and rocks. They progressed up the faces of the mountain, taking deadly aim with their hunting rifles and claiming victim after victim. On their third assault, the Patriots took the crest of King's Mountain. Ferguson, sensing defeat and knowing that he was about to be captured, rode in desperation toward the Patriot line, hoping to escape by fighting through it. One seasoned militiaman took aim with his rifle and shot Ferguson out of his saddle. With Ferguson dead, the Loyalist resistance quickly evaporated. Ferguson's bold declaration never to leave King's Mountain was fulfilled, and he was buried on the battlefield, not far from where he fell. His marked grave remains on King's Mountain today. When the battle was over, 290 Loyalists were killed, 163 wounded, and 688 taken prisoner. Only 28 militia were killed and 60 wounded. Word of Ferguson's death and total defeat at King's Mountain shocked and disheartened General Lord Charles Cornwallis. With the losses of one-third of his army and one of his most talented officers, Cornwallis delayed his planned advance. News of the victory sweeps the country. Rebels flock to join the cause. No longer could the British depend on the American loyalists to flock eagerly to their standard. The Patriot spirit in the Carolinas was invigorated, and the victory at Kings Mountain allowed Nathaniel Green to reorganize the American armies. The Battle of Kings Mountain was a turning point in the American Revolution. Even though General Washington and his troops fought valiantly for over five years, the road to Yorktown and complete surrender began at Kings Mountain. And so even though the American Revolution had been continuing for five and a half years in pretty much of a stalemate, it was only 12 months and 12 days after the Battle of Kings Mountain that Cornwallis ended up surrendering at Yorktown. And essentially at that point, the American Revolution was over. On October 27, 1780, George Washington wrote the following of the battle. The General has the pleasure to congratulate the Army on an important advantage lately obtained in North Carolina. The militia came up with the enemy at a place called Kings Mountain, advantageously posted, and gave him a total defeat. These advantages will have, in all probability, a happy influence on the operations in that quarter, and are a proof of the spirit and resources of the country. This little army, that wasn't an army, destroyed a superior force, and then, like the miracle army that it was, faded into the mountain mists. The battlefield was their hearthstone, clear of mind, pure of thought, determined and resolved. These sturdy people met the enemy, and he was theirs. And by their conduct on that memorable day, the foundation of a great government was laid.